Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real brings you real and authentic stories from fascinating people here in Western Australia. Stories to inspire and equip you to take action to be all you can be. Today, my guest is career coach and managing director of career wisdom, Lois K. Smith. Originally born in Scotland, she moved to WA when she was six years old. Having started out in a career in the financial services, services industry, in corporate relations and management roles, Lois herself changed her career and established career wisdom in 2005 with a vision to inspire and support those who are seeking more satisfaction and meaning in their working lives. In her time, she's not only provided career coaching advice to corporates and executives, but also to elite athletes, dancers, and professional rugby players, as well as young people with cancer. Lois, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Great to be here. Cool. So um, you moved here when you were six from Scotland. Yes. Do you remember anything about that? I actually do. Oh, um, right. That's impressive. My dad Sorry. was, um, <laughs> you're trying to say something about my age. <laughs> that's okay. I'll get you later. Um, so, yeah, I'm six years old. And my dad um, was, was an engineer and he was teaching at Paisley Tech and he got a job in yeah. um, at Wait, which, of course, is... Um, Curtin now, Curtin University, but wait back in the day, WA Institute of Technology. So out we all came and um, I remember going, I don't really remember much about the plane flight, but I actually remember what I was wearing because I was oh. wearing this woolen, uh, green, lime green almost, green skirt and green top and I just remember that we walked down and onto the tarmac at Perth Airport and I was stripping off this top, you know, because it was just like so searing heat. What time of year was it? Oh, it was, yeah, it was at right at the end of the year. It was just before Christmas and right. um, it felt like my eyeballs were singeing, you know, from the sun and then reflecting off the tarmac. So I, I don't think I probably articulated this in my mind at the time, but I think looking back now, I think what sort of hell has my family brought me to? <laughs> you know, but quite very quickly we got settled into a little motel in the city and, you know, and it was great. You know, it was just an amazing journey, an amazing experience and, and a great year or so here. But we actually had to go back to Scotland when I was eight. All right. Um, we sort of went back and then came back again when my dad got permanency in his role. So, yeah, so we it was interesting to be almost sent back to Scotland for a little while. So I had a hybrid accent. I had a Scottish Australian kind of blend. Right. Yeah. And and what do you remember, uh, what was your biggest impressions of growing up in Western mm. Australia? Um, I think, you know, I guess I've never really been a, a beach babe as such because, um, you know, my mum being Scottish, my dad being English, he, he's got the kind of the darker complexion. He goes really dark. But my mum being redhead, I've got her fair, fair skin. So, we, you know, we're always pretty careful in the sun and things like that. But um, other than that, just very free, very open, people very friendly. You know, there's always those little funny moments when you're asked to bring a plate and you literally bring a plate, <laughs> you know, things like that. And just, just really... Um, being curious about this country and um, I was very keen on animals, learning about animals when I was younger and, um, of course, Australia, wow, you know, I, I really can distinctly remember a book that I was given or I got for Christmas or something and it was all about the platypus and the echidna and the wow. kangaroo. It's just so exotic, you know, and we'd see a prey mantis somewhere and you'd be like, oh, my goodness, and pe other people would be going, yeah, it's just this thing, you know. So memories of um, Jolly Mont Primary was actually my first school I went to and um, when we landed here and, and one day there was a, a blue-tongued lizard in, in the school building, like actually in the classroom, you know, and the, the principal just came, came in and picked it up and showed us and then took it out. You know, so, so it was just sort of experiences that you'd never have growing up in Scotland, I think. Yes. I mean, I still have fond memories of Scotland and, um, you know, snow and think fun things like that. But I just, yeah, I just really am very, very appreciative to my parents for bringing us out here and, and that we could grow up in this environment. And I've, you know, got, well, Ed and I've got a daughter now too. So, you know, like it's just a beautiful place to grow up. It's a lot more expansive and freeing, I think. Awesome. Yeah. But awesome. very hot sometimes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. So as you, um, as, as you grew up and left school and, and what have you, and then as I said in the intro, you went initially into the financial services. Yes. And, um, what was the thinking behind that career choice? Yeah. Obviously, career choices is a big topic. I know, so, it is, it so. is. And and it was actually, I kind of laugh now because when I was leaving school and, you know, I was, I was a good student, I, I kind of um, was, you know, 
probably better at the English and English Lit and all those sorts of subjects. I was really good at those and pretty bad at um, physics and chem. So I wasn't going to follow in my father's footsteps. That was pretty clear, him being the engineer. But I, I kind of knew roughly I liked people. And so I thought uh, it was either going to be personnel, as we called it in those days, but HR, um, or people and culture, as we now say, or PR. So it was personnel or PR were my thoughts. So it was going to be around business, but more around the people than the business. Mm. And it's funny that really when you look at what I do now, it's almost those two merged because it's about people and about career and about transition. Um, HR people often engage me to help with that, with the, with their people. But also it's about marketing and it's about um, PR. It's personal PR, branding, yes. that kind of stuff and getting yourself out there and right. who are you and what are you and how do you connect to people and how do you market yourself. So weirdly right from I left school, I actually knew what I wanted to do, but, of course, it didn't exist yet. Right. And that's a real trend I find working with my clients now. You know, sometimes they can't actually imagine what they're going to be doing in five or ten years because it's, it's all going to be quite different. So, um, you know, I use my husband Ed as a bit of an example because he left school and, you know, the really computers, I think you were doing those zeros and ones and you know, it, was, mm. it was pretty, um, you know, not, not at all like it is today, of course, and now he's an online marketing consultant. So that didn't exist. So he couldn't have left school saying, I'm going yeah. to do online marketing. <laughs> People would have thought he blocked him up probably. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so it was interesting that I thought either PR or personnel, but I ended up going into um, working for an insurance company and worked my way up in there. And then I sort of revert, I was doing business um, studies part time at university, actually at Curtin, where my dad um, was a lecturer, and just didn't really enjoy it. I kind of kept going, oh, this is sort of it, but not it. Right. And um, is that some like a, a general feeling? Yeah, just a or? general feeling. And I think also, you know, um, working long hours, family, or not family by that <laughs> stage, but, you know, um, house and kind of, you know, doing other things. And I just, yeah, I wasn't super motivated. Um, and I love learning. I'm always signing up for courses and always learning. I now have a master's degree. So I kind of got that in education later in life in, in some ways because I did that um, very painstakingly on and off and very very stretched out over quite a number of years but part-time. And then I thought, no, I'm going to go the PR. And so I, I signed up, right. went full-time for, I think, one semester. I think I had suspected measles, so I missed a bit as well. And then <laughs> and then I saw this job one day in the paper because I'd always look in the newspaper for jobs, as, as you did back then, and um, I'd circle things and I'd actually cut good jobs out and put them in a little file, and, you know, right. literally cut and paste, you know, with the clay glue. <laughs> and I'd write, you know, West Australian and the date. And I always remember there was a lady that, because um, they had the movers and shakers as well in the West Australian, that was people that had got new jobs. And there was a lady who had this job called corporate relations manager for West Farmers and I just thought that sounded like the bee's knees way back then you know I was like wow that's pretty cool you know so that that whole era of PR was really new at that time as well not many people held that type of title um one day I'm you know going to uni I get the Saturday paper and there's a job for a corporate relations officer at the Australian Stock Exchange part-time and mm. weirdly um, I'd worked in finance. I'd worked for a publishing company for a, for a little while too. So I had sort of an eclectic bit of background and I was now studying at uni and this was a part-time job in public relations. So I felt like I had I had the raw materials, but interestingly when I saw that job in the paper, I put my finger right on it and I said, that's my job. And that I don't do that sort of stuff very often, but for some reason I was just really moved and went, that's my job. And um, I put the resume together and put it all in. And long story short, I got that job and it was fantastic. It was corporate relations office at the Stock Exchange. It was exciting. It was interesting. Dynamic people. We did radio shows. We did, you know, we were on the ABC radio, so farmers would stop their tractors in the, in the paddock to hear the, the, um, the stock report, which I would read, you know, a couple of times a week. And um, we did share days. We did education for the public on how to invest in shares, all of that sort of thing. Um, but as, as happens with many companies, they relocated, um, they redesigned everything, restructured, and took a lot of that sort of um, diversity and variety of that role to Sydney and left education, which was fine and it was interesting because we were rewriting modules and doing all of that. And that was around the time I had Sasha. So I went away on maternity leave, came back, and then went, oh, you know, maybe something new for me. So um, I went and worked for a um, major super fund, an industry super fund, so very member-focused, and that was a real privilege and was probably my first foray into, in a way, a not-for-profit ethos. Yeah. I really liked, I really liked that. And 
um, educating members around their superannuation. I, I really like the members. I really like the employers. I really like going to a chicken factory in the morning and then mm. law, firm, law firm boardroom in the afternoon, yeah. which is literally that fund was that diverse. So that I found that quite hilarious. And, and I talked to people about this super, but that part got a little bit, mm, you know, it's mm. not quite it. And then I had this pivotal moment. <laughs> One day in the office, the financial planner who was down the hall from me, there was suddenly all this erratic knocking and yelling coming from that office and you know, I'm not quite sure what it was. And a few of us went running and it appeared the gentleman and the lady with him had gone in to see the financial planner and had had some sort of cardiac arrest. So I, I rang the ambulance and the, the receptionist um, performed um, CPR. She just done her refresh, which was handy. Um, but very sadly, that gentleman passed away and he was just on the cusp of his retirement. So here I was working in kind of super where I'd, I'd visit employers or I'd visit people who'd go, oh, yeah, I don't really like my job, but oh, well, I'll get my, you know, pot of gold at the end and right. <laughs> and I just kind of I was already having those feelings and then this happened in the, right in front of me wow. and I'm, you know he literally was carried out and, you know days so, before his retirement day before yeah I think it gold. was about six days or something like that so you know and yeah so you make all these plans you know and you make all these sureties about this will be here and that'll be there and plan for this and so I don't know I just kind of went look this is a fantastic job it still is and I'm still you know have a big affinity for that sector and the people in it I just felt like this is a great job for someone else now like I, I need I need to go and to this get show. something new yeah like I already was thinking about it and actually had already started you know thinking about what I'd do instead and I actually read 20 books because career coaching wasn't around. This is a, th a theme for me. <laughs> I decide on these careers that don't exist and then I start moving towards them and then suddenly they emerge. So right. I did actually decide, I read 20 books over a period of time, about two years actually. I didn't know you could go and find a career coach because they weren't really, you know, there were career guidance in schools or if you went to uni, you could probably hunt mm. out a you know, person. Because I remember my career guidance at school, it was basically, yeah. okay, Edwards, you're, you're good at maths, so you could be an accountant, but then you're good at rugby, so you could go and join the Marines. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. So, and, you know, putting yourself in their shoes, that's an enormous job. You know, they're still very underfunded and under, under-resourced, those roles. So you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids, and you've got this person who's yeah. probably teaching as well, and I'm not a teaching background, so I've never worked within, within a school. I've worked with schools. Um, you know, having to somehow plug people into something to get some information and then go here here's all the information you know yeah so I, so I do yeah it's a shame but I, I really didn't know that you could find someone but I, I discovered in reading all these books about finding your passion finding your purpose um discovering more about yourself what did you want to do those sorts of things that so I actually love that that was the general theme of these books then. yes they were all career related books and, okay. and I, I had a lot of exposure to business and personal development as well like um James Rohn was a you know a big influence on me um growing up um, you know, in my, in my late, sort of latter teens and into my 20s, um, I did, did see him um, present. And, um, you know, I guess I had exposure to personal development. I, re I read a lot of that sort of stuff. So in some ways that wasn't surprising that I gravitated then towards career kind of ideas around, you know, how you could develop you mm. and your career and what you wanted to do in the world. So, yeah. So, so how, how did the penny drop then? So you're reading these books. <laughs> there's, there's a career out there that's not – well, there's a, there's a job out there which – doesn't exist. Yeah, it's about to. You're in this book. <laughs> How did you bring yeah. it all together? Well, I think I think the key thing was I decided at that point because remember I'd had that sort of higgledy piggledy, um, you know, relationship with with ongoing education. So I, I mean, I was learning mm. Japanese on the side. I was always learning. It just right. never added up to anything really significant <laughs> in terms of here's your piece of paper at the end of it. So I did, you know, I'd done a bit more of the PR, but I hadn't finished that. I'd done a diploma in financial markets because I was, you know, lecturing on the the share market and the ASX to MBA students. So I felt, you know, it was good to have that. And I ended up lecturing for the, the organisation that ran those courses. So I was doing a lot of learning. But um, I guess with the with the idea of um, what I was going to do, I suddenly found out that um, a, a university in Perth was running a career development um degree or actually like a, a graduate um, program that articulated into a master's and I just went that it was that, probably that moment again when I saw the ASX job I went that's my degree that that's my right. postgrad you know that's what I'm going to do so um, that was really exciting because normally sometimes when I enroll in things I'm really excited and then when I get the pack and actually get the, the notes and the um, 
you know, the, what it's going to outline and yeah. the textbook, I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. the, the moment has passed, you know. But actually when I got all these notes, I was just so excited and I was reading and, of course, many of it was from the books, you know, similar stuff. So is this a new course now? Yeah, a brand new course. So it was just fantastic. So I did that and I did that. I actually was still working in super and, and doing, you know, so I, mm. I kind of thought I'll, I'll do, I'll finish this, I'll do this, I'll work. Um, and I'll complete that, and then um, I had pro rata long service leave, and that was my impetus to um, to leave. It's it's interesting now reading more and understanding more. We often say with clients, it's quite difficult to change not only what you do, so you're changing career, going from an A to a complete like to a Z, but mm-hmm. also mode. <laughs> so okay. I was an employee in superannuation or in financial services broadly, going to be self employed and in. Career coaching. Right. So I completely changed. So you've got a different job and you've got a different mode. <laughs> yes, exactly. And right. I remember um, handing back my company car to a car yard. I had to get a couple of quotes and then I drove in the, and the young guy that did the um, changeover for me, he said, oh, so how come you're leaving your job and you've given up your car? And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to be a career coach, a career counsellor and career coach. You know, I use those interchangeably sometimes. And he just sort of looked at me and then he said, oh, so can you make money out of that? <laughs> And I rem- I don't really remember what I said, but I remember in my head thinking, oh, I mm, hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that was a bit bit of a moment of, of slight hesitation of, of like, oh, what have I done, you know. But um, I guess it was interesting. Like I hung out my shingle, I started seeing clients and things started to grow a little, but probably not as quickly as I would have liked to. Um, interestingly, coming from that financial services white collar background, that's who I got. So I got yeah. young lawyers, I got financial people. You know, so it's mainly by word of mouth, and and um, I did um, get the website up and going with um, Ed's help, <laughs> being in that profession, and he was sort of tinkering around with that, and I did most of that myself. The first one, um, the main thing was coming up with the name because I, you know, run into him and say, "What about this?" And he say, "No, that's gone. You can't have that." You know, <laughs> "What about this one?" <laughs> you know, and then career wisdom just, just I don't know, it just came and it was yeah. right and it was available and all of those wonderful things that click into gear. So that was wonderful, and um, I did realise, oh gee, maybe with this mode thing maybe I do need a little bit of um you know going somewhere and working in with a team I still have a lot to learn I did realize I'd done my qualifications but really I was green and um luckily a nice lady that I just approached who had a drop-in center for careers um it was funded by the state government at the time it was the employment directions network um which now exists as the career center in the city that that was a really fantastic service. So people could walk in. That was at the Midland office that I worked at and just a couple of days a week um, So as a casual. But, gee, I got such a diverse range of clients. You know, I might have had a gentleman who was, you know, at the latter part of his career who'd just been made redundant, um, you know, position made redundant. I had a young person who they'd tell me was at risk and can you sort them out in 45 minutes, you know. And mm. I'd have, um, you know, ladies who wanted to work up on the mine site. So these people came because you were in the space? Yeah, that, so I would uh, I worked for two days casual in the space and then they would, they would be booked in and I'd find I'd go away and do my private work and then when I'd return I'd be told, oh, we've got, we've got some cases for you. And they always seem to be quite hard <laughs> ones but they were great because they tested me and yes. one day they said right Lois you're not you're in the office now but we're sending you out to a high school and you're going to see these you know 15 16 year old boys and I remember feeling a bit like uh oh you know I haven't done that I've, I've done white collar professionals and I, yeah I've done some of these people that are in the center but I was going somewhere yeah. else and I felt I felt the pressure of that actually but hey they were people you know and yeah. I really clicked to one young man you know he wanted to do carpentry I think it was and his dad wanted him to be a mechanic so there was all that sort of stuff going on it was just such a privilege to sit and listen to someone and go wow you know what what is it you want to do and how can I help you with that and so that was a real privilege and interestingly one day sitting at that job um back in the center I got an email from the um one of the senior people who I knew also through doing my master's. So we, you know, we do these intensives together where we'd counsel each other and we yeah. practice the techniques and all of these things. And she, she said, this is an interesting job. You should go for this. And it was career advisor for the Western force rugby union. Right. And I, I laughed because I'm the most unsporty person you'll ever meet. Dance was very much part of my life growing up and um, sport was not. You know, I, I actually convinced years, I think, 10, 11, 12, when we had to do sport, we would, a couple of us who were dancers would go to the sports master and say, can we go in a room with a tape recorder and just do dance stuff? 
and they, they let us do it. They said they threatened that we had to actually perform it, but they never made us do it. Yeah. So I was really not sporty. So when I saw this, I thought, oh, my goodness, I don't think so. But actually as I read through it, you know, it was, it was great if you had some connections to financial education. Wow, I ticked that box, you know. Yeah. You could career counsel and you'd been doing it for X number of years and I just sneaked, sneaked in there. In. I had the qualification. I'd been working with a diverse population of young people as well, so they'd sent me out to the school. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it was amazing. The only, I think, of the criteria, I think that say there were nine, I had eight of them because one of them said, experience within a professional sport environment yeah. and I can still remember where I was standing in the kitchen of our home and my husband was there and my best friend was there and they were all having a hoot about that you know it was like that was yeah. really funny but as I'm often coaching people even if you only have five of the ten or seven of the ten but you can really tell a good compelling story about why you're the best fit right. do it so I had to take my own advice and the fact that I had one that wasn't quite right I had danced semi-professionally and in a team and in that environment where you know, there were slippery floors once and we all had to kind of <laughs> skate around each other and kind of help each other out. So, you know, it's not playing rugby, but I kind of had a, a sense of um, professionalism and, you know, yeah. and, and I admire sports people. I'm not one, but I can admire their dedication um, to what they do. So I wrote something of that nature. And then that interview was like an audition. You know, I had to counsel in front of them. I had to do a scenario. So it was a, yeah. it was a really hard, I felt it was a hard one role, but gee, what an amazing opportunity. And it was fantastic. I mm. absolutely loved it. It was so really you tough. That, so? uh, it, you know, the guys that I worked with, the team, um, they were just amazing. You know, I mean, you had your rock stars, you, had your guys being paid, you know, a lot of money. Um, you had, you ones that were just sort of almost getting into the team and you know and then you had everyone in between and some were studying and some were on on yep yep we know we've got to do something after rugby this is what my program is and great and and some were really self-reliant and then others needed a bit of a jolling um, <laughs> yeah because it's a very here and now type focus absolutely isn't it? you know absolutely. train play on the weekend yeah, yeah. and and yeah, and don't I mean, look until tomorrow really well, no because yeah. you're still in that early part of life aren't exactly you? This is awesome. The sun's yes. going to continue shining. The money's probably great. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for most of the guys who were imports, of course, too, mm. um, you know, being here in Perth, how fantastic. Yes. You know, I was out at Florida. They Most of them live Scarborough way. You know, it was just like a, such an idyllic environment. So me kind of banging on about, hey, you've got to do do something or you know learn something or who can mm. I connect you with yeah it was sometimes met with a little bit of oh you know mm. do we have to but you know I, that was when I thought oh gee I'm revisiting my superannuation days you know where yes. I'd go out to workplaces and the 18 and 20 year olds would be like oh and they'd have their arms folded and they'd be like oh I don't want to hear this whereas the older ones usually the ones that gravitated towards the front of the room yes. and they all wanted to hear my presentation so mm. it was a little bit the same and I guess I'd, I had some resilience around that and you know, I was also doing my practice as well because luckily career that wisdom. was a contract, yes. Mm. So um, career wisdom was still ticking along and um, I was able to do 20 hours a week with rugby and 20 hours a week in my business. I did a bit more with rugby. I found mm. being on site and being able to kind of catch people, you know, like be there and, and see them was good, but that was a great role and, um, you know, it was tough. It was the toughest role I've ever had. Why is that? Um, well, probably for what you just said, Bryn, the um, the dedication to the um, the task at hand. It was only the second year of of the Western Force and, you know, that kind of coaching culture is um, pretty strong and um, it's all about performance. It's all about the game and, you know, it, it just was quite difficult to embed something like career mm. development. But the thing, I guess the thing was I was very, very passionate about my clients as I sometimes refer to them as, yes, they're players and, you know, they're here, but really they're clients of mine and it's my job to help them prepare mm. for their futures and, and that even if that's in a small way, doesn't have to be that they're doing a full blown MBA or whatever. Some of them did, but you know, if I can help, even by just getting them in a public speaking course or getting another skill under their belt, yes. I did that. So yeah, so it was a fantastic experience, and you know, that um, is a very well resourced um, area now within rugby and also within um, AFL and many other sports. Um, you know, now I do that pro bono with um, ballet dancers right. um, because they, yeah, they get no resources whatsoever and they often, you know, they're training from age three. Yes. It's all they ever know. It's yes. a very kind of insular world. So, yeah, being able to um, give a little bit of help, mainly just with the transition side of it mm. for the senior dancers is a real privilege. So, so yeah. If, so if I came to see you uh, uh, as a, in, in your career yeah. coach, what sort of things would we do? Mm. Well, people tend to come to me for two different reasons. So one is 
I don't know what I want to do or I, you know, don't know what to, I want to be when I grow up, some people say. Yeah. Um, and so that that is something I um, offer a career discovery process or program for. Mm-hmm. And um, I use some specialist software that uh, the lady who ran was a supervisor for my master's. She actually developed some software. She's a um, career psychologist and worked with the developer and created some software, which is very holistic. It's just interesting with career counselling, it's not like normal counselling where you might um, purely have conversations and go down. You, know, you do do that. That's an element of it. But there's a lot of data and information in career counselling because right. I want to know what you've done already and I want to know what makes you tick and I want to know, you know, your values and your personality and your skills okay. and your strengths and, and what your dreams are and what what turns you off and you know so there's a lot, like yeah. a lot of things I want to know about you as a person yeah so what I say what's in there like inside you but then also I want you to be able to say to me oh look I've been thinking about these ideas or well, let's capture those but equally you've probably maybe got things that you could do that you haven't thought about yet so that the software that I use actually allows um a client to sit down and, and go, oh, look, a big sifting process. Oh, mm-hmm. look, there's all these different categories of types of roles I could consider and let's sift down to, you know, a number of them. Yeah. So it's great to be able to do that. Sometimes people do get in contact with me and say, um, I want to know what's out there. <laughs> and I yeah. always say, well, we have to know what's in here first, Bryn, and, right. and also what's out there and then put the worlds together. So right. that, that software helps me with that process, but it really isn't a, um, a software that just kicks out a formula and says, well, Bryn, you, you're going to be an astronaut, you know, right. awesome, <laughs> you know, that's your next career. It's not like that, but it gathers enough information that we can have some really detailed conversations but with a lot of data okay. and it provides a framework for that conversation between you and I. So it takes about um, six hours, that process. Wow. Yeah, wow. yes, yeah. so it's fairly intensive. Um, and, yeah, people find that's really great because they go away with uh, an action plan and they sometimes still need to research. I, I call it a little bit um, like putting on a jacket, you know, you mm. have to wriggle around it and see if it really fits you. Uh, being in Perth for as long as I have, let's just say over 40 years, um, I've, I've picked up a lot of contacts and connections around the traps. Say, yeah, because I've worked us. in different industries. and Yeah, because yeah. another question I've got um, and, yeah, is what makes a good career coach? Is it yeah. having a vast network of contacts? Well, not not only, but I guess that's the other side. Like, so when you ask me, you know, what would I do if you mm. came to see me? That, that career discovery. Two, yeah, two different types. That's right. Of so thanks for keeping me on track. So career discovery, and then the career focus. What I call a career focus is more when people come to me and say, "I'm I'm here and I want to get there." So they already know what the there is. Right. It's just they're struggling maybe to put the pieces together. So like me saying I'm here and, you know, a superannuation manager but I want to be a career coach, what are the steps, you know? So and sometimes more recently it's been people saying I'm really skilled, I'm a professional, I've been applying for jobs and I'm not getting anywhere. Right. I'm not getting shortlisted or if I am I'm not getting through the interview. So, you know, there's the self-marketing bit again. So the PR comes back into play and it's helping the person go, well, okay, you've identified B, you're you're at A and you want to be at B, you've identified what B is, but let's unpack it. What else is there? Who could you talk to? Do you know anyone? Maybe I know someone, you know. What's your LinkedIn profile like? What's it, you know. So we basically unpack all of those bits around around their brand and how they show up and around um, their documentation right. but also their strategy because some people are very blinkered you know I say how have you been looking for these jobs and they say oh seek I've been going on seek and I go that's great what else oh seek <laughs> that's all they say so yeah. it's like oh you know a strategy has to be a lot broader really these days you've got a yeah. lot of competition you've got you know a lot of competition for these jobs yeah, and um right. and then yeah and then the other part of that is unpacking well is a job exactly what you want so back to mode and you remember when i was mm. leaving you know you don't change your career in mode well you can but it's harder um these days i work a lot with people who are maybe going to have what i've had really for the past 12 years is a portfolio career So they've maybe had a contract or consulting work, but they've also done something else and something else. It's like a pie. Right. And, um, you know, that's... So they've got, like, a number of jobs on the go. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. And it depends on, you know, your terminology. If you say, well, that's self-employment, that's employment, that's casual employment, that's contract, you know, we can can sort of get into the nitty-gritty of that. But really, yeah, it's it's different modes of work in, in essence. And each of those requires a bit of a different strategy. Because you can't really trot up to someone who's going to engage you as a consultant with a normal job CV. 
it was a different look and feel to that, you know. Yeah. So, so it's all of that sort of thing that I just love helping people with. But I like both sides, and both sides are really relevant. So, back to your question about, you know, it was around what what a career coach needs to have or needs yeah. to be. So, what I, yeah, makes a good career coach? I think a lot of things, and probably I expand out career coach to career counselor slash coach because I think. You do need those counselling skills. You need to be able to listen and really listen to the narrative and the story and be able to go, oh, that's that's a clue. I want to go down that path. So definitely yeah. counselling skills, particularly for that career discovery type of area. And then coaching, um, you, know, you know, can learn coaching skills as well. I think it's good to have a bit of a marketing hat on because mm. you, you're you dealing with the person, you're dealing with the market, you're dealing with a particular role or type of work they want to get to. You need to help them unravel all of yes. that you know so it's and look there's a lot of there's motivating in there there's you know there's listening there's encouraging there's you know dealing with people who've had a redundancy you know that there, there is actually holding that space for them emotionally mm, and, I was and say, yeah so, surely you must also end up with particularly in the last you know two or three years here in western australia when yeah. people much like myself mm -hmm. um all of a sudden with the falling barrel price and yes. iron ore price and things like that and you know things slowing down um, you kind of have people who are not necessarily, I've got a job and it's time for me to think about something else. Yeah. And more a case of, well, I don't have a job. Now. Exactly. I right. had one last week. So yeah. how do you, there's got to be a bit of almost grief shock. Or... Oh, definitely. There's actually um, Kubler, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, published a theory around grief and you know, I, I share that with people and, you know, some are like, oh, it's fine, you know, but, but no, it's, it's really important that they understand mm. it's like any um, grief or loss of, of a loved one or a pet or a job, it, it, you know, for many people it's, it's, it's really wrapped up. Their identity is wrapped mm. up in that and as can well. Can you take us through the stages of? Yeah, well, the, um, I'm just trying to think of the order of them, but there's really, it, you know, what, what I explain with, with that with people about it, it, they can jump around. They're not necessarily se sequential, but there's often anger. Yes. There's often denial, but there can be the opposite of anger. Like you suddenly feel quite joyful and, you know, I'm yes. free. And then you go and look at your bank balance, you know, and yeah. then you're back down. Um, depression, uh, bargaining. So trying to somehow make it work, you know, you might go back to your employer and say, hey, but what about, you know, so or even just bargaining in your mind, what if I had done this or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, you, Many of those you can up, go up and down and through and, and, and cycle back through. Yes. So it can be a bit of a roller coaster, but eventually you do get to acceptance. And once you get to acceptance, you know, you're usually already on your way. But, you know, I, I work with people wherever they are in that cycle, and I think it's most important that they understand they will feel like that. Yes. You know, probably by their third application of having to write all those selection criteria, and I'll suddenly yeah. go, I'm angry or I'm, I'm depressed or, you know, but they won't always, you know, examine that. I, I um, think it's really important for a career coach to be very cognizant of mental health issues and be able to refer appropriately. So, you know, I've got mental health first aid training. I've, you know, I've, I've worked actually alongside mental health organisations before. So I've got a fair understanding of that and I have some very good psychologists I can refer people to as well. So I think that's really important as well. People feel yeah. completely supported because it's really hard searching for work when you don't have work. Your yes. rug's been pulled out from under you. Uh, it's really hard searching for work when you're not feeling good about yourself and that you're feeling you actually may even be clinically depressed. It's not great. You know, you're not coming from a strong place. But lots of people are in that position, whether they're coming and seeking help and they're in a mm. job um, or the redundancy has happened. But equally, you know, many people I see that they feel a sense of freedom and actually are quite relieved because they felt it was time to move on. But you know, it had just happened at that time. And yeah. people do say later, wow, we did this really immersive deep dive into my career and me and the outside world and we've done all this work and I probably wouldn't have come and got that. Yes. But I'm I'm glad it's been provided, you know. So a lot of people when their positions may be done at the company engages me. So that's a way I'm working with them, but they haven't had to, you know, the person I'm working with hasn't had to pay. That. Yeah. Um, but equally, do people do seek me out as an individual as well mm. for the same sort of process? I, no, yeah, I certainly remember when um, I was made redundant mm. um, with the fall in barrel price. And at the time, you, you're concerned and you're worried. And, yeah. You know, because we get everyday life and, and, and to a degree our identity is, is wrapped up with our job, yeah. wrapped up with our paycheck breaks up with our ability to provide a shelter and put yes. food on the table for exactly. our family and all of that. And so as soon as that is pulled out, 
it can become quite frightening as I experience. Very much so, yeah, very much so. And I guess that's uh, it's, it's another conversation for people when we talk about values because it sometimes comes up for people that one of their values is, is job security um, or security, but often when we unpack that it's around income security and that's another conversation around modes of work because, you know, it is a full-time permanent job, mm. <laughs> inverted commas, permanent job better than working maybe contract or having a couple of things mm. that you do, like having that portfolio. And neither are right or wrong, but certainly when people see redundancies happen, I think they start to think, wow, maybe having, whether it's the side hustle, that's the, that's the you know, the favourite terminology of the day, but, you know, having other things that you're yeah. developing and working on and, and that kind of have other things in your corner really that you can um, mm. grow or develop. Because certainly yeah. um, to me, at the age of 43, you haven't seen what I've seen. The concept mm. of job security just seems an alien idea yeah. now when yeah. the, the full-time employee could be made redundant just as quickly as a contractor or a staff. Yeah. yeah, and it's getting people to realise that without um, necessarily scaring them but just gently educating. Mm. Um, I mean, the book I'm about to release, <laughs> it would oh. be an e-book first, mm. it's called Make Your Move and it is about work search and attraction in, in, in essence, it's about moving from the A to B but it, I do talk a fair bit about work modes because I feel it's important to start educating people more about that and that there's many different ways to work and you might go like me in and out of those over time, you know, like really I describe my, myself as a portfolio career person really for, for the last 12 years yeah 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 and just finishing off the question because you asked me about what, what good about a career coach I think the other thing is being able to it's not it's not expected but being able to connect people even just to an, a proper association or organization that can help them or or a warm introduction is worth gold you know when you're working with Yes. someone who's not very well connected for whatever reasons, but that's where they're at and that they need some help. You can do all the coaching in the world and you can go, hey, yeah, look, we've got all this action plan and this is all great. But that one kind introduction to someone who says, yes, sure, connect them, it's okay. Goes you know, I always do, yeah, you always are going to check, you know, make sure. Um, and then that maybe they can have a coffee or even just have a phone conversation, whatever that is that's appropriate. Yes, it can go a huge way, even just to find out some more information, but it can lead to another connection. I always teach my clients, you know, what's the what's the one thing you ask um, after you've had the coffee with someone or connected with someone? And it's always like, who else do you think I should be talking, talking to? to? I mean, yeah. obviously say thanks and you buy their coffee. Indeed. But who else should I be talking to? Because that takes you even further. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. say that to all my guests yeah. on the podcast. Awesome. That's cool. <laughs> Indeed. And, and sorry, can I just go one more? Because I, sure. I think there's one more there and it's around – um actually walking your talk in what way and i suppose um as a career coach i i interview i've interviewed other people and i've been interviewed for yes. roles and for casual roles or for contracts and that sort of thing so i think not getting too removed from the actual act of what you're asking your clients to, to do. do right <laughs> yeah. that's important yeah i th I, th I personally think so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah um what are the um sort of focuses of myself and and with this podcast, he's looking at the sort of transition that goes on between the ages mm. of 35 to about 40. Yes. Do you have many people come to you in that sort of period? Yes, I do. And, and what do you see in there? Um, there's often a uh, – it, it varies and certainly sometimes they're 30, 40, 50 as yeah. like this, but, but other times, yeah, 35, 45. Um, and sometimes, interestingly, it's not always about changing career. That That's what presents. Mm. Um, and some clients are already wise to the fact that they may move to something completely different, but they're, they're, they're going to move with it. So any problems or things that are, are about them or that they've internalised, mm. they're going to show up wherever they go. Yes. So that's a kind of a, a, a good conversation to have. But I guess the other thing is that people get really immersed in their work, as, as you just said, Bryn, you know, the the kind of wrapped around their identity and all of those aspects that sometimes because of the holistic nature of the way I work with people and I find out all about their hobbies as well, that's all part yes. of the questionnaire and, you know, we kind of, and they may be thinking, why is she asking me this? But it's yeah. all relevant because um, sometimes I find people are at a juncture where they're not very happy and that can be for environmental reasons at work and toxic culture and all those things. 
sometimes it's like, well, I see you play guitar. How long ago have you played? Oh, you know, string broke and it's in the back cupboard and you know, I haven't yeah. played for years and that sort of thing. So mm. sometimes it is actually reigniting um, who they are and what passions they have and interests they have and, you know, they've maybe got so busy that they haven't connected with other people for a long time right? Um, or their love of learning but they just haven't been able to learn anything new. Or, you know, so, so what you're mm. saying is there's almost like a, um, a deficit or something that they've not done which um, feeds them. Um, in one part of their life and then it's showing up in their, in Sometimes. their workplace. It can be that, right. yeah. I mean, so they're all very varied with, you know, yeah, what, what, what drives them and that sort of thing. But certainly the other is um, yeah, it's just a bad workplace, a bad work environment, which mm. is a real shame, you know, like um, it's, it's very common. And sometimes people feel they've maybe entered an industry that just isn't aligned to them, you know, like it looked good as a subject to study at uni and they did really well. And then they've entered an industry that's mm. just very unforgiving and long, long, yeah. long hours. The theory of it, yes, on paper sounds great. Yes, or in a TV brand. show. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. yes, very glamorous. You wear awesome suits. Oh, you wear and... awesome suits. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's young and attractive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, but then when you get there, there's the actual reality of it. Mm-hmm. And it, it's interesting you say that because um, you know, with a ten-year-old daughter myself, and people are asking me about. Um, you know, whether she's going to go to university or whatnot, and you know that's that's going to be like a hundred. She's going to end up with like a potentially a hundred grand debt if you're going to university. <laughs> now, yeah. given that, is it better to go out and try a few jobs and this, that, and the other, work out what you want to do, and then go to university? I mean, it's it's yeah. up for debate. I mean, I'm all I'm a big fan of the gap year, like because yes. I don't know if parents like that when I say that. And oh, you know, three, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I had I had a midlife gap year, yeah. so I did that did that then, but um. I, I do think young people have to find themselves. They have to know more about what makes them tick. Like when I'm working with someone, you know, who's 35, 40, like there's so much I can find out about them and, and mm. you know, they've got history. That You know, yes. there's so much to, to see and to know. And a young person's still discovering that. So I, I think a gap year is a great idea or going and volunteering or all of those things are great. But, you know, the, the thing is whether it's uni or work or their own enterprise or a combination of all of those, it's probably going to be more driven by what it is they actually really gravitate towards and the most logical path for that at that time, which I, I, I predict perhaps for your daughter may not necessarily be a traditional way of learning mm. and getting into whatever is in, of interest to her that mm. we, we've been accustomed to, you know. MOOCs, you know, massive online open courses on online, um, short courses you can do. You know, I, I just for fun once looked up, you know, it was a Harvard physics, I think it was a physics professor or something, you know, he was showing um, a pendulum swing and it nearly knocked him on the nose but of course he had it exactly worked out so that it didn't it didn't hit his nose yeah. you know that was online you know you can really you can you can actually do just about anything you want to learn about you just probably won't get the certificate unless you pay pay yeah. the money so I think I think it's just really it's very interesting times now mm. and um, I think each person has to chart their own path and that might mean again those different modes and it's probably more important that they make um, discoveries and connections you know, out in the world, yes. that tends to that be warm lead and, yeah. That tends to be how to you be. yeah how you do anything. You know, mm. um, and when you think of my junctures, some of them have been hey, there was an ad and I went for it and got it. But other times, it's been a little tap on the shoulder, or you know, I've been yeah. able to facilitate a connection to someone else. So I think that's really important to um, to be open. You know, not just say, well, okay, you want to do this, you've got to do that. You know, there's this, yeah. there's this. Actually, I, the pathway word I tend, tend to not like because it's used a lot in, um, you know, you leave school and then there's a pathway for this and there's a pathway for that. And a long time ago, I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but someone said a quote that um, careers aren't like there is no pathway anymore. It's more like crazy paving and you lay it as you go. Right. Like that. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, go, going back to the sort of thirty-five to forty-five. Yeah. Um, so you're seeing in there people who are, are probably lost touch with the stuff that they enjoy. Yeah, sometimes. Yep. Um, what else are you sort of seeing? Yeah, there? definitely um, toxic environment or just industry wrong. You know, not good alignment with the industry, or just the person that's chosen something maybe for the parent 
you know, or, oh, or the teacher said, hey, you're so smart, you should do X or whatever yeah. influences that they've kind of just been buffeted along and then say, hmm, you know, what's that old you know, wrong jungle? <laughs> you know, they're, yes. they're in the wrong jungle. So um, helping them realise, okay, well, who are you? So, again, going that internal who are you and then and the external bringing the two worlds together. So sometimes, um, yeah, that, that parental influence is very strong, and unfortunately, and the young person is maybe shepherded into something. So by the time they're 35 or 45, they're actually suddenly realising, you know, I didn't really choose this anyway. I just sort of fell into it or it yes. chose me. Yes. Um, and then they decide, well, I'm going to actually now be more determined about where I want to go next. Um, people that realise they are really the master of their own destiny and they can put a stop to what it is they're doing. Yes. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. I was it's say it's quite hard. Because uh, I've had guests on the show who have um, realised, you know, either through ill health or yes. just some sort of um, revelation or awakening that what they're doing is not for them. Mm. So then the, bit, the thing I'm interested in, because you get to a point, you know, you're in your latter 30s, 40s, so mm. traditionally you're going to have a um, few kids, you're going to have a yeah. mortgage, yeah. you're going to have this. Yeah. And, you know, you get this feedback in a job that you might be talented at, at it, mm -hmm. talented as sure. in related to the salary that you get. Yeah. Um, but it might not necessarily feed you and give you the meaning. However, you've now become embroiled in a lifestyle yeah. Yeah. that is dependent upon this sure. incoming thing. So, yeah. you know, where before we were talking about somebody losing mm -hmm. their job and then all that sense of identity being threatened. Yes. How do you help someone when they get to the realisation that, oh, yeah, this is not what I really want to do. My heart's not in it, mm. but my heart's in this, but it might mean going back to college for a couple of years or yeah. taking a lesser job or yep. going out by myself. Hmm. But I still have these responsibilities. Yeah, How yeah. do you help them with that? Um, yeah, I mean, part of when I'm working with people for the career discovery, part of it is even asking about all those considerations, not not detail around their finances or anything like that, but, but what are some of the kind of immovables or what are some of the, um, mm. not try not to use the word, it's not constraints, but just, just you know, some of the life, like well, yeah. what are some of those aspects? And, you know, people put in no FIFO or no lots yeah. of time away. You know, no, a classic one is no needles, blood or surgery. <laughs> some right. people say, I don't want that. And then they later on they think, oh, vet science sounds good, you know, and you have to go, oh, no, it might not match. So, you know, what I often say to clients is no career decisions made in a vacuum. You know, you do have life around this and there are yeah. things you've committed to or that you still hold dear. But that doesn't mean sometimes some of those can't be challenged. And yes. I think um, that's probably the other schism that's coming in is we don't have the full-time permanent longevity of work and yet our financial system is built on that mm. and, and mortgages are built on that and all of that sort of stuff. We don't, yes. won't get into that, but, you know, that's that's – Sometimes people actually go, you know what, well, I've got this much asset, I'm actually going to reinvest in that or, you know, someone mm. I knew went back to uni for two years to do a master's and, and just kind of had paid the mortgage forward a bit but then just managed to re rearrange something with the bank. So I, I think the answer really is that everything's negotiable Yes. and there are always options. Yes. Some of them are not very palatable options. Mm. So it might mean, you know, even for the rugby players, some of them it might it took them, you know, eight years to do a degree. That's agonising, isn't it? Yes. But probably not as agonising as getting crunched on the paddock. But, um, you know, um, you, you make these choices. You go, you know, well, that's important to me, but I'm going to just eke that out and I'll get there. It's incremental, you know, like it'll happen. So sometimes it's a slower role than they probably wanted or it's um making some compromises and other times mm. it's you know what i i've sort of hitched my wagon to this particular way of thinking for a long time and i'm maybe going to unhitch it and look yeah. at some other ideas and that that's not for everyone either one of the things that's interesting when people talk about um starting their own business or enterprise or you know becoming a freelancer is a bit of a risk profile like what sort of risk taker are they because yeah. of course some people are like, oh i'm just going to chuck it in and go and you know do whatever and then others are oh no i couldn't possibly do that unless i have x in the bank or x times 10 in the bank or x times a thousand in the bank because I see different people and I ask them how much would it have to be and the range is enormous. Yes. So every individual brings their own set of rules mm. and, you know, ways of being and sometimes that's just it's not my job to give them financial advice or anything like that but it's sometimes my job to just um, ask them to reflect on some of these aspects because sometimes they don't match, you know. I want this, you know, oh, hi, I want to change my career and I hate what I do but I earn, you know, six-figure salary, you know, times three, and then 
but I don't want to ch- anything of that to change. <laughs> but you know, now I want to go and work in a charity doing X. You know, like right. so. So you know, so there's a bit of a reality check, and that's my job too, is to say, you know, how do you think you could work that? And let's go and look up salaries. And oh, oh gosh, yeah. you know, gosh, there's quite a discrepancy there. You know, so sometimes I think um, people do have the rose-coloured glasses, and they think I'll just flip from this to this, and then they realise it's maybe not so simple. And it's going to take um, more steps. Yeah. And part of the work I do with people is making those steps a little bit more bite-sized because it can seem insurmountable, mm. you know. Um, but, you know, for the most part, people find out what they really want to do and they're energised by that. So then yes. it's just like, how can I make this work? Yes. And there are many ways, you know, there are many ways to do that. Sometimes it involves the household. So, you know, mm. if there are teenage kids and there are, you know, um, partners, etc. like, how, how can you make this work? You know, it's a conversation that's sometimes a bit broader than, than the person I'm sitting in front of as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, I, th- I found it interesting when you're talking about portfolio of work and, mm. and different modes and changing this, that and the other. Do you think there's any sort of, um, from your view of what you said, do you think there's any sort of threat to the future of your standard nine to five? Oh, employee? definitely. Yeah, well, it's, all, it's already occurring really because, Companies are referring to the contingent workforce. So they'll always have, um, you know, there'll be like a, a small band of people who work mm. like permanently and are always there, yeah. but they'll rely a lot more for the bulk of it for um, short term. You know, that could be a six month or a two year or something like that. Yeah. Short to mid term, everyone else will be just add on for projects, freelance, that sort of thing. Mm. So hence we're seeing those platforms emerging where, Um, you know, companies can go on and say, we just want, you know, someone to do this job or this task. So, you know, you've even got, you know, um, freelancer Upwork, you know, those kind of organisations or or those kind of platforms. And then the the freelancer can go on and go, oh, well, I'll do that job and I'll bid for this. I mean, it's it's a dangerous um, state of play in some ways in some of with some of those platforms because it it tends to be a race to the bottom price-wise. Yes. Um, But there's always people who are really good at what they do and can um, make sure I that they that they give value and that they, they present their, their brand and their reputation and they're referred. So, you know, there's, there's a variety. Um, so a, a writer that I really enjoyed reading, one of my 20 books or several yeah. of my 20 books actually all those years ago, um, 12 years ago now, were um, from Charles Handy who was a yes. yeah, London School of Economics uh, professor and, uh, you know, come from the oil industry and and he, he actually he coined the term portfolio career. And um, he, he knows talking about the empty raincoat and written all these different books, and and it's just fantastic to actually see a lot of his predictions because he, you know, I think he wrote those some of those books in the seventies. Um, is is coming to pass, and he's talking still about you know these these much leaner organisations in terms of there's going to be less of those permanent full time jobs yes. and a lot more that what they're referring to as the contingent workforce from the employers mm. um, angle. It just means people, yeah, will have to be a lot more adaptable. We're seeing that already now. But it will be even more so in the mm. future. Yeah. So I suppose that adaptability, reflecting on what you've said, is, is mm. the ability to understand um, a what's going on in the environment yeah. and seeing where, where things are moving and where things are not. You know, um, during my time working in oil and gas, yeah. I found it I found it surprising that some people in certain roles were surprised that they were let go when you could predict the end of that role because the project. Sure, absolutely. So taking some time to sit back, listen, and look at the environment and see where the cycles and movements were going to go. Yeah. Whilst at the second time being completely cognizant of what's inside of you. Yes. and, And where to go. So having that. You know, look out, look in, look yeah. out, look in, and and being able to balance the two. Definitely, you really Is that a key skill you oh, see forward. Absolutely. So you have to know yourself really well, and in some ways that means it's a danger just to be okay at stuff like, oh yeah, I'll do that because that's easy, or I'll do that. I can put my hat, throw my hat in the ring and do that. You're actually better getting really good at what you love and what you're good at, you know, because that sort of you know that sweet spot between what you're great at and what you really have flow and enjoy and, and just love doing, and that can take a while to find. But yeah. you know, you're much better honing that because when that's in demand, and let's hope it is, and that's the thing you have to watch. You, you're it. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you're just like, oh, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll just do anything. You know, some people get um, to the point where they're looking for a job so hard and then haven't had any luck. They say to me, I'll do anything. <laughs> yes. 
be careful what you say. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, really, yeah, you know, that sometimes they're just in, in that mode of thinking for a little while. But um, really understanding what you have to offer and what uniqueness you bring to something that's 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 the key but you are right you've got to be able to read the play so in a way in a, in a sports sense you know yeah. but I um I attended a great breakfast where a prominent um, businessman spoke and he talked about the importance of prescience in his career and I okay. thought what a beautiful word you know <laughs> quickly went to my dictionary you know say, and that's a, did, yeah what? so that art of being able to to read into the future in essence and yes. some of what you were saying you could probably see things were going a bit pear-shaped you could see some movements within the organization so that ability to, to look forward in time and not necessarily you know predict 100 years from now or even 10 yeah. years but but even within your office and what you've heard and what you know so it's keeping your ears and eyes open too but that yeah. uh, that art of being able to somewhat predict this is a likely outcome and you know that particular gentleman's an investment banker so you would hope you would hope yes. that presence would be one of his skill sets and mm. it essentially is but that, that's something we all need to cultivate better we need to understand ourselves better we need to be able to be adaptable and build our skills all the time and reinvent ourselves and be adaptable. And then we also need to be able to read that play or, or have that mm. prescience. I think that's really important. So that's having um, – so, yeah, and listening to you, that's that's understanding who we are but then not being so attached to that sense of identity, mm. not being so attached to this current place that the that, that work seems to be in yeah. that um, we become so rigid. Absolutely, yeah. Because, you know, yeah. uh, um, you know – I've met a number of people who've been in the company 15 years and it's been their life and while they might have moved within it, yeah. it's still their life and et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'm not dismissing that, but then the day all of a sudden they get made redundant all yeah. for some reason, then that, that's just caves in their world. Yeah, for some. And then others just have been a little bit upset yeah, about the shock thrive. of it and then just come mm. in to my office oh, with a biggest smile on their face. Yes, yeah, good. And, and they did really enjoy it and they did feel the loss. So it's actually interesting, and I think that yeah. comes down a little bit to personal resilience. So, wow. you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about a lot of things you need to, to do to be able to navigate your career well and certainly being able to bounce back from adversity and, mm. and have an inner strength. Um, you know, in sport we'd often talk about mental toughness. Yes. So, you know, like just to be able to have that clear thinking and not be like going, mm. oh, no, we're behind, we're going to lose. You know, out. you can't do that. You've just got to keep. It can't keep calm and carry on, you know, the English say, yeah. don't they? <laughs> have a cup of tea, you know. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I think I noticed that with clients as a real diversity um, and, and maybe sometimes, you know, the criticism sometimes for, for our young generation coming through is that us as parents, we've, we've kind of not helped them with resiliency because we've sort of driven them everywhere and kind of, yeah. you know, looked after them t too much almost in terms of, no, mm. you can't eat that sand anymore, you know. We would just go out and play in the in the forest or whatever in Scotland and, you know, chase the dog. The dog would run away and then we'd have to go and find I've him. A number and, of guests you know, yeah. previously talk about that. Yeah. yeah. CEO yeah. of Nature Play who talked oh, about how. awesome. Talked about learning, you know, going out and having kids, and, yeah. and and the fact that we drop them off everywhere. So yeah. we drop them off, and then but now, spread. but isn't it funny that um, Uber does now too? <laughs> yes, it does they, for they're us. quite accustomed to that. You know, mm. I'll just get an Uber, and you're thinking, oh, I used to ride my bike through sleet and snow. You know, it's that's interesting. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so in some ways they're adapting very quickly. But I do have a little joke of, you know, I was one of the mothers that um, adopted the thing of pass the parcel, but you you'd wrap each, um, each bit and put a Fredo frog or something, you know, in between it. This is going back, you know, for 18 years ago or so. So yeah. forgive me for, you know, it should have been a, an apricot or something healthy, but you know, it was yeah. a Fredo frog. But, you know, there's one under every wrapper because we, you couldn't have not have a prize when the music stopped, could you? You know, and I laugh at that now, but I think that's that's probably one one of the examples yeah. of not helping someone to be resilient. That You know what? You didn't get that job. You opened up the wrapper and there's no job, you know, like you applied and you didn't hear. So a lot of the time I'm spent with um, coaching people who are trying to get from A to B, um, you know, they're quite despondent sometimes mm. around I haven't heard back from the company. And I do have a rant occasionally. I have a like a LinkedIn post that's around companies, please, you know, respond to your people. <laughs> you've advertised, yeah. you've asked for people's applications, they've sent them in. But similarly, I suppose you you've know. got to tell your clients what yeah. they need to hear not what they well want. They, they need to be aware that that's that's the culture of of job seeking unfortunately at the moment as many companies don't um do that courtesy mm. of acknowledging the application and then actually saying whether you got it or not 
and it's, it's got to be, it's back to that mental toughness and resilience, send it off, do the best you can, hone it, market it, send it off, email, whatever it's, you know, upload, whatever you're doing, and then reward yourself. You know, you have that cup of coffee then or you have that whatever little walk or whatever it is, and it's next. Yeah, next. let that go. Let it go. And, um, you know, for me over the years, and, you know, I've, I've had a few different roles and contracts over the 12 years of career wisdom, I've also gone for jobs and gone for contracts and done things and not always mm. got them. Yeah. So I've had to practice that myself. And it's not always easy. You go, how could they possibly have not, you know, shelter yeah. this to me for that? Why are they not in my <laughs> seeing how I see this role and how perfect exactly, I would be? Exactly. But, you know, um, I, actually I, I was in a company once. I worked for a charity, which was awesome. So I've done some not-for-profit um, management work as well. And I was um, hosted within a, a large management consulting company and it was fantastic. And so I'd hear little snippets of conversation around the office sometimes. And there was a lady saying that she was cl cleaning up and she found in a garage all her applications. Now, this is someone who works in a management consulting role, quite, quite a sort of mid to senior role from what I could tell. And she said, wow, I had 400 applications. Wow. And I was like, I mean, I don't know how long back, you know, far back they went, mm. but it's just really interesting, isn't it? So, yes. like, when when do we feel sorry for ourselves and kind of go, oh, I'm, I'm having a tantrum and going home? <laughs> you know, like, obviously, I, I often coach people to go for jobs that they aspire to and that or they know that are in the pocket and then ones they aspire to as well, not necessarily going just to what they think is going to just be the easiest. Yes. There is always a strategy of the good enough job, like if you've just – had a redundancy or you're out of work, you know, the good enough job's okay just to tide you over and then still keep looking for the next going, one, you yes. know, at least you can live and eat. But um, I think it, just that resiliency around, yeah, that, that process that it is really, it's a bit like sport or any other thing that mm. you do. There's going to be times when you win and there's going to be times when you lose and you just have to keep going and have that, that, um, that yes. ability to carry on. Um, and and I, I do see that as a big part of my um, role mm. as a coach is to assist with the, the ups and downs of that as well. Mm. I mentioned in the introduction that you did some work with young people with cancer. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so um, that's for an amazing organisation called Red Kite. Yeah. And um, that was actually interesting how that came about because I'd, you know, worked in sport obviously and worked in different guises with career development and young people are just beautiful to work with. They're, you know, they're quite fun and, you know, mm. and, and, yeah, they're just very uplifting. And this so. is career coaching. Yeah, so career counselling. Yeah. And I actually thought one day, I thought, well, it would be really cool if there was something like that for, for you know, young people going through cancer. And I knew about an organisation called Canteen. But I, I did a bit of web research and I came up with a, a, um, a page, a web page for Red Kite. I started reading what they do. And it's interesting. I kind of looked at it, researched it. I noticed someone on the board that I could get in contact with. And then I just kind of parked it and I learned over the years. I used to sort of want to do something and try and force it to happen. Yes. And I've learned sometimes you've got to park things or put them on the back burner and then yeah. just get on with plant life. Seed. Yes, yeah, plant and a seed what and see what happens. And so for some reason I was busy, so I, I, like, I thought that was just an idea in my mind and I was kind of curious more than anything. I thought, hmm. And then lo and behold, I'm on, you know, I'm on my laptop one evening. And I, again, I can remember where I was and it was sort of evening. It was a bit dim and my, you know, the seek, <laughs> the seek I was on seek and this popped up and it was, you know, uh, education and career support yes. consultant with Rick. And I was like, wow. And mm. it, was, it was like, it's magic. Here it is. You know, so, so I had a bit of a laugh because it was almost like I conjured this thing up because it was the absolute first time they'd had this role. Right. And I was just like, this is awesome. And um, Much like, like career. Coaching at the start. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so my fingers sort of flew on the keyboard. It was such an easy letter, cover letter to write, which, you know, sometimes people really struggle with that. And when you can um, really align with the role, it's so much easier mm. to say, I really can do this and want this and, you know, express your interest. So that was a lovely um, two years I spent um, as, as a contractor in that role and actually, yeah, doing a little bit of work with them to help them. Um, recruit at the moment actually mm. which has been really nice but those young people you know um, from diagnosis through to sometimes unfortunately relapse and um, and hopefully you know for many of them getting better um, just helping them rediscover and sometimes discover they're at that age where they really are discovering what they'd like to do sometimes mm. they've been at university they've had to drop out or for a little while or, or cut back but then they can add on units um you know, but I think sometimes it's just about hope and something you'd said earlier, Bryn, around, 
you know, people kind of um, realising what they really want to do or having having some hope around mm. that. I did work with a number of young people where that was the case. They um, were on a track that was okay. They yes. weren't that excited about it. It was all right. Oh, you know, and I know someone can probably get me a job later and, you know, that kind of. And yeah. then cat size in their life and it just for some of them and everyone again is very different but for some of them it is that wow you know what i'm gonna go and do that mm. you know and it was like a the real... guy passing out in the office well oh, gosh you right. know it just yes yeah, it's, it's, it's again yeah. like it's a reminder for me that yeah you know um life is short and unfortunately very short for some people so it provides that lens of clarity Amazing. So we had, um, yeah, just when, when I was working with Red Kite, some amazing grants and, and opportunities for people to um, put in an application. We have a Dare to Dream grant so they can say, you know, I want to be a race car driver or I want to do, I want to go back and study cookery or whatever it might be, and they can be creative about how they go about that, you know, putting in their submission and just amazing to see, yeah. you know, people striving you know and yeah I, it's very humbling very humbling experience working there because sometimes you thought well, what have i got to complain about yeah, <laughs> absolutely nothing you know and some of the young people just worked so hard you know they worked so hard while they were having treatment oh very much so yeah very much so yeah sad sometimes too yeah 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 all right yeah. so um a couple of questions about yourself yeah um what what would people be surprised to know about? <laughs> Ooh. Um, well, I, I kind of did leak it earlier because I said I, I did dancing earlier on. But, mm. yeah, I, I do have a pair of tap shoes. Yeah. And I just recently, oh, about a year ago now, I, you know, I ordered some online and thought, oh, I'm going to go back and do some tap classes. So I've sort of re, so in, in a way, I've taken my own advice of, you know, disconnecting from some of the things mm. that you really enjoy because of time or whatever. And um, these tap shoes arrived in the mail. Back in the old days, you got the tap shoe and the taps, and then you had to take them to a boot maker and they had to hammer oh, them in. in yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and not too much. They couldn't be so hammered in that they wouldn't rattle a little bit because that's obviously right. the tap noise. But nowadays, you just order them and they come from this beautiful dance, um, you know. Uh, place shop online shop and oh yeah. just they're all ready to go and you know what I put those on my feet and they fitted perfectly and then I did a few steps and the dog went <laughs> she ran away from me and yeah. it, was, it was quite fun so that's that's been you know that's so so occasionally when I do present because I do um, speaking about career development and you know talk about different things to to corporate groups sometimes and, and associations that kind of, so you know whenever the PowerPoint slides are, are going to fail I, I can tap dance you know that's my oh, right. that's my claim to fame excellent <laughs> excellent if you could go back to um, have a chat with yourself earlier in life mm -hmm. what piece of a career advice would you give the other? Mm. That's a tricky one. When you're looking at those jobs in the financial sector. Yeah. And, you know, that's it's a funny one because really where I am now and the juncture I am now, like it didn't, like as, as we often do when I'm working with clients, everything kind of happened and led you to this point, you know. So I might have whispered in my ear, hey, you're going to be a career coach, so just jump to that. But you know, like it didn't really exist. So I think it would just be, you know, keep being open and keep, keep, well, you know, stay curious. Yes. <laughs> I probably take Steve Jobs' <laughs> advice, yeah. you know, stay curious and hungry and foolish and all that sort of thing because really, um, and I think also be brave. I think, uh, you know, handing back the keys to the, the, the you know, the company car. car to go and hang out my shingle knowing not very much really at that point. And starting a business as well was kind of in some ways a bit crazy. So it probably was a bit foolish, but, um, but it, you know, it was really what I wanted to do. It was mm. what I really desired to do. So probably, yeah, back, you know, back yourself, be, be courageous, back yourself, mm. that kind of thing, which is easier to say when you've got um, a few more years on you and yeah. you know you're going to be okay, you know. Cool. Yeah. What's the best piece of advice you've had? <laughs> oh, um be on LinkedIn? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about that. Gosh. Actually, no, because um, there's a wonderful Scottish man in Perth who ha has retired now and he was my mentor. And I rang him up one day and said, you know, I'm think I'm doing this career stuff and, and he did a lot of transitions, so career transition and outplacement work. And, I, and he's a Scot. 
<laughs> and I said, you know, how did you do this thing? Like, what did you do? And, and his, his advice was, well, it wasn't necessarily advice, but he told me what he did and basically said, just get on with it, you know, something like that. But he basically said, you know, you just um, get the office, have a credit card, get started. You know, you write the modules of whatever you're going to be using, if it was a program or something like that, and you, you just get started, really. Just do something. Do it. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, um, you know, I guess the perfectionist, you know, comes out at times and you go, oh, it's not quite 100% right. It's not, you know. And um, these days we talk about, you know, minimum viable product and, and iteration. Mm. And so I think, yeah, he was probably ahead of his time too, the fact that he said just get started and you can keep going and finish it off as you go yes. um, was, was great advice. And it was like he was courageous and he demonstrated he was courageous and, you know, he still took time out and played golf and, you know, yes. <laughs> he, he made sure he had time in his day, which um, which I adhere to also. Awesome. Not, not golf, but, you know, have some time out. And finally, if someone's sitting there and they are seeking a job and it, dreading Mondays or because it's either stressful or that it's rusting out or whatever and and they just know deep down that it's not right. What's the first couple of things other than coming and seeing you? <laughs> uh, what's the first couple of things someone can do to actually unpick what's the right thing for them? Yeah, definitely come and see me, Brian. That would be the top yeah. of the list, but no. Um, yeah, look, I think not getting down about it because it, which is hard because that's often yeah. you know, how they're feeling, but it's very common and I think, unfortunately, a lot of people hide it. Oh, how are you? Yeah, fine. Yeah, good. Yeah. You know, and there's the Monday morning catch-up and there's a Friday afternoon wind down and, you know, it's just somehow people struggle through the rest of the week. That, that That's often the case and people put on a brave face. So realising you're not alone, that a lot of people struggle with this yeah. and, um, you know, thinking it through around well, what, what are my avenues. You know, I can go and see someone professionally. I could read a few books and sort of you know, self-reflect, I think sometimes a bit of a circuit breaker. So either going, you know, on a little retreat or having some time off um, to, to, you know, some people like to do that just to have mm. a bit of a recharge because they come away a bit more fresh um, and, and with a clear mindset and they can come sometimes back into the workplace and see it with different eyes, which can be quite interesting. Um, but, you know, if it really is genuinely getting them down in a, in a bad way, like I, I often talked about the Sunday fog, um, so, you know, about three o'clock in the afternoon, I only really had this once in my career with, with a job that wasn't so good. But, um, you know, around three o'clock in the Sunday, I was like, oh, no, because tomorrow, you know, mm-hmm. and almost by three o'clock, you've sort of got to get your clothes ready. You know, you sort of, you're almost mm-hmm. in your mind getting ready perhaps to go to work, which often is a great thing, you know. It's oh, awesome, you know, I'm doing this tomorrow or whatever. But, yeah, if you're not in that place already, your weekend's being encroached on by the Sunday fog, which leads into the Monday morning, oh, no you know, which is pretty an awful way to live. So I think if you are genuinely feeling depressed and actually down on that, because, again, there's that um, dual duality around being able to be clear and cognizant to make some clear and good decisions, Mm -hmm. which, you know, obviously I I help with people with and many professionals help people with, but there's also being right and well within yourself. Yeah. And often I think that's the most important thing to address Yes. Um, but I think they can be addressed together because, yeah. you know, you may go off to a counsellor or a site, but that, that you could be there for years, yes. you know, because like, there's, there's many things that can be unravelled about everything in life. Exactly. So I think you just make sure you're safe and that you're okay mm. and then but you also. can start, you know, whether it's books, whether it's talking to people. I just sometimes caution talking to too many people around, yeah. I'm not happy, what do you think I should do? Mm. It's like, A, you're putting quite an imposition on that person because they don't know all the details and they're not trained, you know, and I think that's hard. But um, certainly saying, oh, look, I noticed you do this and I'm really interested in that, so could you tell me more about it? That's fine. But I think not putting too much pressure on other people to sort of solve your problem, you know. That, so there's a little bit of, yes, ask yeah. for help, but don't expect, you know, them mm. to solve everything for you. I think I think mm. you're also remembering my time. It, you're, it's also uh, being mindful of, yes, acknowledge that you're not, in a great spot, play space with all. Yeah. But being mindful of who you go and talk to. Definitely. Because um, you don't want to end up in just some woe fest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, my job's let's go to the pub and just talk about how rubbish it is. Absolutely. Yeah, that helps nobody. And mm. and actually that's part of often my coaching when, when a redundancy has happened and the person's going through that, <laughs> that cycle of grief over and over and over. You know, just we work quite hard on having a little piece to say. We call it a transition statement. But in essence, 
this happened, this role, you know, the restructure, this role was, was made redundant. So as a result, you know, I'm no longer working there. What I'm looking for is, yes. and then sort of start chatting around. Because leaving that, even planting that seed, if that's a chance encounter in the supermarket, at least you've left that person with a positive planted seed around, hey, I want to get going into this type of organisation in this sort of role. Yeah. You know, your, your um, brain will work on that subconsciously yes. and suddenly a name will pop out later maybe and you'll be able to help that person or at least mention them or something. Yeah. You know, so I think any time you can be in the right space where you leave someone with something that's actually going to not yeah. make them feel bad and also further your cause as well yes. is, is the better way to go. But, yeah, it, it takes practice, you know, and some people are just unaware. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you, really. And thanks for being very open and honest about what, what – you know, your job and your role and, and some of the intricate parts of it. Pleasure. I think there's been a ton of really useful stuff in there to think about, certainly redefining um, certainly redefining how we look at work, not just mm-hmm. in our job, but our mode and portfolio and and all and working through all those implications of the fact that, you know, we can make changes, but it's just a matter of sitting down and, yeah. and looking at those and what have you. So I think um, it's been a super valuable conversation. Um, if somebody's um, been motivated enough to come and see you, how can they find you? Yeah, they can find me at careerwisdom.com.au awesome. and send me a little message and I will have a nice chat with you and we'll see what happens from there. Excellent, excellent. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bryn. Thank you very much to all, uh, the listeners who have listened to this. Um, hopefully, once again, we've given you something to uh, help you to be all that you can be. And uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.